I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. To get to the truth of the matter about the potential for wider war in the Middle East following the conflict between Israel and Hamas, we have with us Norm Rule, who's a senior advisor to CSIS's TNT, Transnational Threats Program. Norm is a former national intelligence manager for Iran for the United States government. He's a former senior CIA Middle East expert analyst. Norm I could go on and on about your long career for the United States government. First, I should say thank you for your incredible service and welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Andrew. It's a pleasure to be here. Norm, we're seeing stuff in the Middle East. You you know, months ago, you were on this podcast predicting how this wider regional war would begin to play out in the Middle East following the attacks, the vicious attacks of October 7th on Israel and Israel's response to Hamas. And we're seeing this play out exactly the way you said it. I know you're not surprised, but tell us what you're seeing and what more can we expect to come here? Thank you. And uh, thank you for, uh, again, having me today and Happy New Year to you and to your listeners. I think the bottom line that I would put forward is that none of the actors involved in the current Middle East crisis have a strategic driver which would compel them to ignite a broader regional conflict, a conventional war. All of the aggressive actors in the region, and here we're mainly talking Iran and its proxies, have multiple incentives, however, to maintain and even slightly increase the intensity of the existing violence they are undertaking against Israel and the United States. So here's your danger. Over time, that level of violence becomes normalized. And over time, the angle of that violence tends to increase as what used to be red lines are deemed pink. And people say, well, I haven't reached far enough. Maybe I can reach a little, a little farther. We're watching missiles being fired from Yemen, perhaps Iraq, that in 2014 would have been something inconceivable and deemed as a cause for an international involvement in a regional conflict. Yet nothing really happens. We're watching, in essence, a seventh front war for Israel of varying degrees of intensity and periodicity of attacks. Again, something that in 2014 or 2003, we would have seen as something that would have ignited an entire regional conflagration. I think the lesson there is that in many ways, we are off the map. If the characters are behaving according to how we would expect them to behave in such a conflict, the level of all of this behavior is something that no policymaker has faced in modern times. And tell us about what's going on in the Red Sea. The Houthis are shooting at the United States. Houthis, the Iranian proxies from Yemen, they're shooting at U.S. interests. They're shooting at interest in the, in the Red Sea. They're shooting at Israel. Why is this being allowed to continue? Well, if you listen to Houthi propaganda, they would say they're attacking Israel and Israel-related shipping. And this isn't the first time this happened. In the early 1970s, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine undertook similar attacks against fuel tankers going to Israel. And those attacks were halted by Israeli action against the Palestinians. These attacks, because of globalization, because of uh, sloppy targeting, because of perhaps intentional targeting outside of the Israeli issue, are now touched more than 35 countries. Container traffic has been largely diverted from the Red Sea, although some oil shipping continues. There still remains a fair amount of smaller shipping in the Red Sea. The container traffic is important. Container ships are huge. They may carry 4,000, 6,000, 20-foot containers of very valuable cargo. And in many ways, a container ship is more expensive and valuable than an oil tanker. And the insurance rates in an industry which has traditionally narrow margins are much, much higher. We're watching about 95% this varies by day, but let's say 95% today of the container shipping that used to go through the Red Sea now divert itself around Africa. A trip that if you're going to Rotterdam adds about 3,000 miles to the trip 
a week to two weeks of transit. It reduces the number of cargo ships available because they're busy going around Africa. It raises fuel costs by half a million to a million dollars a ship. That transfers to consumers, and it starts to delay the arrival of material for a series of industries that have traditionally succeeded because they have just-in-time delivery of supply. So you're watching supply chain distortions begin to appear. You're going to have some inflationary impact, particularly in Europe, but this will be offset by the deflationary pressures I think we're seeing worldwide. But this now is a concern. As to why we allow it to happen, there's a little bit of the it. We're watching a series of missiles, drones, and at least one explosive drone boat having been launched by the Houthis. Let's go back in time a little bit. Some years ago in the second Obama administration, the Houthis attacked the USS Mason and the Nitsa. The U.S. response was deemed proportional, and that in essence was we immediately attacked the radar and the launch site that launched the weapons against our ships. Our ships were not damaged. We shot the missiles down. We have a very different approach now. That proportional response now in essence says the following. We will defend against an attack. If an attack does not succeed, we won't take action against an adversary, which is an extraordinary development. So in essence, if you're an adversary, your position is, nothing happened to me when I fired against Israel and the Americans. That probably does good thing for Houthi commanders' local reputation and for the Houthis' ability to say domestically that they're fighting back against Israel and America. Remember their flag. It had Their motto is, curse the Jews, death to America, death to Israel. So you, in essence, have no reason for the Houthis to stop attacking. So it's not unreasonable their attacks continue. We do need to be concerned about these explosive drone boats. And we need to be concerned that the Houthis might launch naval mines. They also have a capacity for that. This is, uh, this is unprecedented in international history. One more bit of geography. Your listeners should think in space as well as in the time, the chronology. There are about eight major maritime choke points in the world and a handful of secondary choke points. Three of them are in this area, the Strait of Hormuz, the Bab el Mandab, and the Suez Canal to the north. This is an incredibly strategic, important area for the global economy. And the international community's response in this incredibly important area is certainly being observed by other adversaries and other adversaries will say, if they handle the Babel Mandab threat that way, how will they handle a threat against the Strait of Malacca in Asia, or perhaps the Mediterranean, the uh, Gibraltar, or in the Panama Canal? I'm not suggesting attacks will take place there, but I'm just saying adversaries will note this response and say, this is now how we respond to threats. It is hard to believe that the Houthis are getting away scot-free so far with this. Where's the red line? Is there a red line that we know of that they could push on and that's it? That's the end of the story for them? It's a great question. I think first we ought to say, what is a red line? What's a red line supposed to be? The best red lines are red lines that are meant to support existing international law. They're meant to support the existing international, the global order framed by those laws. This isn't to create new precedents. The best red lines are those supported internationally and involve multinational response options. And also the best red lines are those for which you had planning. You don't want to be in a situation where a, a crisis develops around you and you've never thought about it and you've got to make it up as you go along. That's where you can't predict the secondary consequences. So let's look at the red lines with the Babel Mandab. Is this a violation of international law? Absolutely. It touches many nations. Does it threaten the global order? Absolutely. It's touching multiple economies right now as we speak. Is it something that multiple nations would defeat against or respond against? It's happening right now in the Red Sea, whether or not they're part of Operation Prosperity Guardian a title which I think sounds like a bad translation of a Chinese life insurance company. But whether or not they're in that, that task force, there are multiple countries in the Red Sea, Arabian Sea area who are protecting shipping. So we have the framework for the violation of a red line. The challenge becomes how you plan to respond to this. And it appears as if perhaps either not sufficient policy thought has been given 
to what has been a fairly predictable situation for many years. The Houthis, their weapons, their attacks on energy in the Red Sea occurred against Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, and their enemies have been the same. Or it's a situation where international policy, and you've got to say the United States and primarily Britain and France have agreed upon this, will be that we won't respond out of a concern that we might escalate a regional conflict. And again, I go back that if that becomes your end response, you have to say, well, you're a Houthi commander or a Houthi leader. Tell me the incentive you have to stop attacking ships in the Red Sea. Tell me the incentives you have to continue attacking shipping in the Red Sea. It's a fairly predictable situation that this is going to go on. So let's pull that thread just, just a little more. So what happens in this environment? Well, if we follow our current procedures, we will continue to defend and not respond to the Houthis. There's some evidence that that policy may be coming to an end. The British defense minister gave a fairly stark statement, which is the type of statement you give publicly, not as a threat, but as a way to underscore that you are serious to partners and adversaries. Okay, we've done that. But if this policy continues and the Houthis continue attacking, then we either maintain our policy of we don't respond to attacks that we defend against, or there is what I call the catastrophic success by an adversary, the golden BB, a missile or drone that maybe takes out the bridge of a container ship and leaves it with dead crew members and with floating in flames in the middle of the Red Sea. An attack on an oil tanker, which creates a large oil spill, which in essence would shut down shipping in the Red Sea or impact oil prices. Or last, of course, an attack that would kill not only maritime, civilian maritime personnel, but US military personnel. At that point, if you take the administration's response to Iraq as a template, we would likely to respond with something proportional against a series of Houthi sites as a way of communicating to the Houthis, you need to stop and we will take the action to you. I don't believe that will be any more successful than the strikes in Iraq have been to deter attacks against US forces, simply because Iran has a lot of proxies to burn through. The proxies themselves don't pay a lot of attention to their losses. In the end, this will only stop when whatever actions we take touch the leadership of the Houthis to, in essence, tell them, if you do this, your strategic equities and indeed your existence on this earth will be threatened. I think we're a ways off from that, but we need to be cognizant that any time, at any time, perhaps even while we speak, that golden, terrible BB could get through defenses and create this, this gravity sink of actions that pull a variety of players into um, a situation where no one wishes to be. You know, Norm, it's interesting. The Israeli defense minister, Yoav Gallant, told the Wall Street Journal last night that, and I quote, he said, my basic view, we are fighting an axis, not a single enemy. Iran is building up military power around Israel in order to use it. Israel's pretty clear in their statements and their actions. Israel now carrying out more targeted strikes against Hamas leaders this morning against a Hezbollah leader. We can expect Gallant and other Israeli officials have said the war is entering a different phase now. Why is it that Iran continues to be permitted to infiltrate our democratic ally in this way? Well, to be clear, it's not only attacking our democratic ally, but it's also a partner. It is also impacting the global economy and prices will rise. There will be hard economic decisions for a number of our allies and partners in Europe and for the United States itself as a result of Iranian actions in the Red Sea. And most importantly, there are American men and women in the military who don't get a vote as to where exactly they're going to serve, who are now catching drones, missiles, and other attacks. Their lives are on the line. This is as, as important a question as you can get to. And I think the issue there becomes we have not developed a policy in the international community against gray zone actors. And there's been plenty of wise writing on this. In fact, Seth Jones of the Center wrote a magnificent book, Three Dangerous Men. I recommend it to all of your listeners. You get a real sense of what gray zone 
activity is like and what the players are thinking. And at the same time, you should ask yourself, okay, since then, what exactly have we done in the West, in the United States in particular with our defense doctrine, to touch revisionist actors' aggressive strategies? What have we done to combat that? And the answer is actually darn little. The Chinese continue to move in the South China Sea. Iran continues to send money, people, and stuff to a variety of actors who exist to conduct lethal activity. And you're watching even Russia with its variations of gray zone activity through the now somewhat transformed Wagner Group. The issue becomes, what do you do against such an actor? It's not that sanctions, I think, have been overused. I think that less impactful sanctions are now routinely described as impactful sanctions. If you were to look upon oil sanctions against Iran, they have, in essence, collapsed. Iran's oil sales to China, which are funding Iran's activities abroad, are at an all-time high. The Biden administration and our European partners haven't done much to constrain that. In fact, I think the most significant action against the Iranian oil sector in the last year was conducted largely through the instigation of an NGO, Truth and Lending, for which I'm an advisor, called United Against Nuclear Iran, where they assisted the Department Department of Justice to seize the cargo of an Iranian oil tanker in the Gulf of Mexico. If you're Iran, you ask yourself the same question as the Houthis. What's the, what's the reason I need to stop this? What am I losing by engaging in this activity? And again, the response to Iran must be the same as the response to the Houthis. If this is simply going to be a sanction against people who have no money in Western banks, don't use international financial systems, don't travel to the West, and the regime doesn't want them to travel to the West. Well, why do we think that's going to touch the thinking of Ayatollah Khamenei or the head of the IRGC? At some point, policymakers have to um, grab this nettle, and it would be a, a controversial and unpopular decision, but it will take some form of military action against Iran's interests combined with a sense that the United States has the fortitude to endure any counteraction from the United States and maintain a long-term approach. If that occurs, I believe Iran will change or moderate its behavior. If that does not occur, there is no reason to expect Iran to change its behavior. So, Norm, you mentioned that Israel is basically in a seven-front war right now. Gallant, again, told the Wall Street Journal that when it comes to Gaza, they've entered an intense maneuvering phase of the war, which will take on different types of special operations. Is Israel capable of dealing with a seven-front war by itself? Well, let's break down the fronts. You've got Gaza, the West Bank, Lebanon, Yemen, Iraq, Iran, and I, I, Syria. I'm sorry, and I think I've left Syria in, in something out. So in, end, in, in the end, you've got very different adversaries, and therefore different approaches can be applied to those adversaries. It's not all about a, a missile. It might be a cyber attack. It might be a, a drone attack. It might be a naval attack. The uh, Israelis have a naval capacity in the Red Sea. They have a commando capacity, which is spread awfully thin in Gaza, but they've got... They've got various capacities to apply against these actors. Now, Israel is not interested in creating a second front war, but it's got to calibrate based on its rather impressive intelligence capabilities and political rhetoric aside. It's, you know, political rhetoric gets everyone excited, but you follow actions, not words, as a wise policymaker. And their actions against Lebanon, for example, have been calibrated. So let's look at the Lebanese situation, because I think that's your next crisis. And it's probably one of the top three issues that Secretary Blinken is addressing on his uh, multi-country uh, trip to the region. There are 80,000 Israelis that have been moved from the Lebanese border south. Their businesses are collapsing. They're out of schools. Their uh, uh, lives have been disrupted. That's a tremendous political problem for the Netanyahu government. And they've got to return those people to that border. Let's talk about that border. There is no wall on that border. There are blue barrels. There are actually lying, blue lines on the ground. This is a very porous border. Let's go north a little bit. In 2006, United Nations Resolution 1701, which has never been executed by the Lebanese in, in any significant way, was supposed to include several principles. No military force in the South except the United Nations forces and the Lebanese armed forces. No weapons coming into Lebanon. The disarmament of armed groups in Lebanon outside of the Lebanese Hezbollah. 
it hasn't happened. Now, you touched upon the Israeli reported killing of a Lebanese commander today. Who was he and where was he? This was Wissam Tawil. He's the commander of the Radwan forces, named after Ahmad Mohniya. They're a commando group, and they've been responsible for most of the attacks on Israel from Syria and the Lebanese border in the last weeks. Where was he located? 3.7 miles from the border with Israel, exactly where he shouldn't have been. So Israel didn't send in thousands of troops. It didn't conduct thousands, you know, hundreds of missile attacks. It conducted, according to press reports, the killing of what is to date Lebanese Hezbollah most senior official lost in a war that's already cost Lebanese Hezbollah about 130 personnel. That's attempted calibration. So when you say, can Israel respond to the seven front war? If your response is they will respond in a calibrated manner based on their understanding through intelligence and experience and history, how their adversaries think, absolutely. And work in the sure. international community as well. All right, so let's talk about Hezbollah for a second. Recent reports in the Times of Israel indicate that Hezbollah has an even more impressive, if you will, set of tunnels than Hamas does in Gaza. They have more missiles, they have more capability, they have more capable fighters. This is a real threat to Israel's security. Do you expect that Israel will continue to proportionally try to take out key leadership in Hezbollah? Or, or how do you think this is all going to play out? Well, it's certainly a threat to Israel. I just want to throw the footnote in. It's also a lethal threat to the tens, if not hundreds of thousands of Americans and many other nationals in Israel. This is a threat, therefore, against the global community, just as the Hamas attack on October 7th was an attack on the global community. 30 Americans dead. How many British, how many French, et cetera, et cetera. So Israel, in order to undertake such an operation, would have to go forward with a massive military force, a massive air attack, a massive series of other types of attacks. This is would be tremendously consuming for resources, for materiel. It's a fair question to ask. Do they have sufficient ammunition, and this would be for a long-term conflict. How are those supply lines working out? What would they rely upon with the United States? There's no reason to believe that Israel would want to do this. Israel's best option is to get a Lebanese Hezbollah somehow pushed north of the Latani River, which runs parallel to the border, about 27 kilometers, I think 27 kilometers or miles from the border. In the short term, you deal with the shark closest to the boat, that's Gaza. Lebanese Hezbollah is a shark that you may have to deal with, but it's farther away and you have more time to think about that. And your goal right now is get those civilians back, start a diplomatic process that involves the international community, see where that goes, and conduct calibrated attacks, which in, in a way are messaging to Hezbollah, which in essence says, look, if you do this, you're going to have a bad day. Stop. Prior to October 7th, Salah Aruri was living well and happily. Wissama Tawil was, was alive. They conducted attacks on Israel. They paid for it with their lives. And that's not an unreasonable end game in such a situation. Lebanese Hezbollahs have got to have that internal discussion to say, how do we respond sufficiently to show that we have skin in the resistance game, but nothing that provokes this Israeli attack and keeps our commanders from being killed? One more comment, and I, and I apologize for going on. The Salah Aruri killing, which the press has reported is attributed to Israel, Israel has not admitted that, and the death of Wissama Tawil are precision attacks. It did not involve deaths of other civilians. It did not involve, uh, it involved attacks on moving individuals. And that conveys a sense of significant intelligence capacity. So if you're a Lebanese Hezbollah leader, you have to sit there and say right now, someone got Salah el Aruri while he was moving with five or six of his senior most commanders responsible for work from Lebanon against Israel. Someone got Wissama Tawil while he was moving with another commander responsible for Lebanese Hezbollah operations against Israel. How confident am I that if I were to make a decision to undertake such attacks, that I will be walking this earth 24 hours later? And I think that is in itself an appropriate constraint that probably is shaping Lebanese Hezbollah deliberations, and it should. And what exactly is a strong deterrent, in addition to the one you just described to Hezbollah, what is a strong deterrent that Israel can send to other Iranian proxies? Policymakers worldwide have three options. Diplomacy, economic pressure, lethal action that touches the strategic interests of any adversary. Do you or do any of your listeners think a diplomatic demarche would convince Lebanese Hezbollah Iran to stop its actions? 
Do you or any of your listeners think that sanctioning the head of, of, of Lebanese Hezbollah, a new sanction against Nasrallah, will change their behavior? In the end of the day, you have to have a threat against the strategic leadership themselves and their, their core equities. Because if you go out of those core equities, you've got plenty of equities and they don't care about their people. So in many ways, killing someone that isn't or pressuring someone that isn't a senior most leader in a way they really feel it, in essence, gives them a reason to justify their onward attacks. So that's a tough nettle to grab because policymakers then have the fear of escalation management. And the West for a number of years has been a little too much maybe constraint in that regard. I think uh, Fareed Zakaria noted it well in a recent foreign affairs article about our constraint of our own power may be a little too excessive. There's sometimes a sense that if we touch an adversary, the next day means 300,000 Americans in a 20-year war. And I don't know how we reach that situation where one kinetic action is seen as a causus belli when we've just seen in recent months many actions for that that have not produced that same thing. Yeah, I've got Fareed's article sitting right here on my desk. It's called The Self-Doubting Superpower. America Shouldn't Give Up on the World It Made. Pretty tremendous, incredible, incredible statement just in the title. But it's something that has been talked about in Washington for some time. Self-constraint ha- is, is appropriate. We are a ginormous power. You don't want such power unleashed in the world unless that decision has been very carefully considered. But I don't think we really run a risk of miscalculations in the Middle East. All the players involved have been in their chairs for a long time. Well, for the most part, the Western players tend to come and go with more frequency. We don't run a risk of miscalculations calculation, but because of who we are in the West, we run the risk of overcalculation. In essence, what ifing ourselves out of a meeting time, and then we're into another topic, and then it's two weeks later for another meeting, and we never really make a decision as to how to handle something. And an adversary really enjoys such a situation, it allows the Houthis to keep doing what they're doing without any particular response. Let's go back to Gaza for a minute. Israel has really flatten northern Gaza. They're trying to find Yahya Sinwar in southern Gaza. There was a report yesterday, former general, Israeli general Amos Yadlin said that they know exactly where Sinwar is. He's just embedded himself with a bunch of Israeli hostages. And so it's really hard to get to him. I'm sure we've all imagined that scenario many times over in our heads. What do you think is most likely for this next phase of the war between Israel and Hamas in Gaza? The war thus far has not been a surprise. The Gaza conflict is unique in modern or perhaps world military history. It's not only a very small area, densely populated with a population that really can't get away. The refugee camps aren't tents, they're buildings, which are not only labyrinthine in nature, but quite tall, which means you've got to go every floor, every room in your clearing operations. And you've got not only the extraordinary tunnel complex, but as the attacks take place, either by the Israeli military against those buildings or by Hamas, which is blowing up its own buildings if they believe they've got enough Israeli personnel in the building, you in essence create even more firing zones. All the while, you have multiple world media present videotaping. All the while, you have cell phones videotaping every attack and issue and sending underrated, correct or incorrect stories around the world. No military has ever faced this challenge. We didn't face this in Fallujah, Mosul. This is new and fresh. It's not a surprise that we've seen the devastation, therefore, because of the nature of this conflict. Now Israel is moving into a situation where it can't move the population. World pressure on civilian losses are significant. This now becomes more of an intel-driven conflict. In fairness, they have killed and destroyed much of Hamas's fighting capability. But in fairness, they still haven't eradicated Sinwar, Deif. There are some battalions of Hamas operatives that are still fighting. And as Israel lowers the intensity of its actions against Hamas, that lengthens the length of the conflict because it allows these operatives to continue fighting. This is going to become more, much more of an intelligence-driven war. And even there, you've got to think about what the intel challenge is. Imagine going into, into an environment where you're capturing laptops, thousands of documents, hundreds of prisoners you have to debrief and analyze and pull together real time. 
I don't think an intelligence service has ever had such a terrific challenge because the Israelis want to avoid civilian losses and their own military losses and bring this conflict to an end. I think it's that we look at this, this conflict, you're often hearing the phrase, the day after. I don't like that phrase because I think you're going to have the days before the day after, which we're watching now with Tony Blinken and everyone trying to pull together a conflict, five minutes after the day after, as we decide who is going to retain control of security so that these thousands of other armed personnel don't create a Hamas 2.0 or an ISIS 2.0. And then the months after the day after, where we watch the Israeli and Palestinian political process play out to create the framework that allows us to reach a resolution during which Iran and its proxies will not be sitting by saying, we're just going to stand here until a Palestinian state that accepts Israel comes into existence, they're going to want to complicate the situation. So I think we have these three different timelines playing out in a conflict that it's naturally going to be extended as it becomes lower intensity and more focused on intelligence. What could change this? Yahya Sinwar and Deef are captured and killed tomorrow. The Israelis conduct a series of attacks that somehow manage to kill a lot of the Hamas operatives. And if those things happen, you're going to watch the Hamas effort fragment and come apart. I'll close by saying when people want to criticize the Israelis for not identifying the location of and killing uh, Sinwar, how long did it take us to find Saddam Hussein? And he was hiding in a hole. If you're hiding in a hole and there are tunnels... You've got that. And by the way, the Israelis still have hundred, you know, the hundred plus hostages that they've got to return to include Americans. And that will constrain the nature of their violence in an increasingly smaller area. This is an unprecedented military challenge. Norm, you know, you alluded to this when you said Hamas 2.0, Hezbollah 2.0. If Israel is successful in really decapitating the Hamas leadership, and they've already had some success, They can kill those leaders, but they can't kill the idea of Hamas. But doesn't it make it a lot harder for Hamas to regroup if you take out these senior people? Absolutely. And I I am confident that Israel has the capability, intent, and likely will achieve the death of Hamas's top leadership. And here, I'm not only talking about the first and second tier leadership, such as Sinwar to Salah Ruri, but I'm going one layer lower where you're talking about operational commanders, the battalion commanders of Hamas, who are experienced, sort of the captains and colonels of any military. Once you go below that, you have a force that lacks cohesion, experience, et cetera, et cetera. Here's the challenge. Israel has killed between eight and 10,000 Hamas fighters thus far, but that's still going to leave anywhere from 10,000, 15,000 armed, young, highly indoctrinated men who have been through fighting, who have no economic prospects, no hope, have reasons for revenge, and they're going to be wandering, and many of them will have kept a pile of grenades, a limpet mine, an RPG, not just as a souvenir, but for their own capacity. So in that five minutes after, the day after begins, someone has got to be on the ground to basically put basic security in place, or these folk are gonna take charge of their neighborhoods, that then creates a coalescence. They're not quite terrorists, but they're certainly extremists and thugs. They will push back on any sort of structure that the Palestinian Authority is able to put in place. And and I think we need to have a, a plan in the can right now to say, what do we do to ensure that these guys, these armed guys are disarmed and taken care of? If not, we face exactly what we saw in Iraq, where the prisons were emptied, the Ba'athists all had weapons, and they all went home and they turned into something we can't predict. We, we should have humility in saying we can't predict where, where this will go, but we should have the confidence in saying we've been through this experience in Iraq and we have lessons we can teach the Israelis and that we, the international community, should accept as well. What's the chances, what are the chances of ISIS reconstituting itself in Gaza, in and around the region, given all this instability? ISIS is less likely. We still have pressure on it in Iraq and Syria, although that has become more fragile as a result of the last couple of months. But in fairness, when you talk about Palestinian groups that are in Gaza, we should remember ISIS is present. 
The Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine is there. The Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine General Command. The Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine. It's unlikely these groups are going to become the new dominant factor, uh, the no dominant uh, player in that area. But it should remind us all that there isn't just Hamas, that there are capable and perhaps malign political leaders in Gaza besides Hamas that are, will be standing when this is over, and to include remnants of the Palestine Islamic Jihad. Norm, this is, as always, really, really helpful, and you've given us a lot to think about. Thank you so much for your time today and for these tremendous insights into really, really difficult problems and difficult days ahead. Thank you very much for having me. This is not easy. There is no perfect solution, and everyone involved, the United States and elsewhere, is doing their best to bring this to a, a satisfactory conclusion. But this is going to be hard, and we need to accept that. Thanks again, Norm. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts. From Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 